welcome to the first in our series of webcasts introducing some of the finest companies in Yorkshire. With particular attention paid to those that are in the Yorkshire T20 portfolio here at Mold Valley Asset Management. My name is Duncan Sanford and I'm a Director and Portfolio Manager here at the Yorkshire branch in York. Now today's format is going to take three sections. The first section is going to cover the top down, looking at inflation and interest rates and the impact on our bank accounts. The second section is going to showcase one of the Yorkshire T20 companies, ITM Power, who are the world leaders in hydrogen power. And finally, the third section is going to introduce Mark Brewer from HGH Accountants, who's going to discuss the importance of cash flow over the next 18 to 24 months, where cash flow is clearly going to be a very important aspect. So I'd like to welcome our first guest now, Alan Higgins, the uh, Chief Investment Officer of Coots, the Queen's Bank. Now, Alan has multiple decades of investing, uh, I believe four market corrections. Um, yeah. Four large market corrections. Four large market corrections, very good. And you know, he's achieved many successes in a long, distinguished career. He became the uh, head of fixed income at Dyra at age 27. And today, Alan's here to talk to us about inflation, but with interest rates below 2% for the next decade. So not great for our savings, our bank savings. So welcome, Alan. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about the, your, your idea behind interest rates remaining so low for a decade. Yeah, thank you, Duncan. So it has really changed. You, you know, it takes me back. You, you mentioned, uh, started talking about corrections. I've seen, you know, four big ones, which I'm going to come to on interest rates. But the, the first big one was 1987. I just started my career. And what a difference. The key difference is uh, equities then were competing with circa 9 to 11% interest rates in the US and UK. Uh, so just step back a bit, imagine that. Just um, in order to do, earn an attractive return, uh, nominal and real, because inflation wasn't that high then actually, uh, you just bought 10 year corporate bonds or even 10 year government bonds, and for 10 years sat back and did nothing. If only your life was so easy, eh Duncan, today. You know, and sadly those days are long gone. So, no, you don't see them returning. <laughs> no, so which brings us to today. So um, I've been a low interest rate, um, God, a kind of, uh, you, you could say, uh, I've been pounding the table about low interest rates for some time. Now I believe they're going to be ultra low. And um, firstly, where's the evidence? So there's a lot of evidence out there. Um, whether you look at Japan, 20 years, very difficult to generate any inflation, obviously zero in, in, uh, interest rates. In the Eurozone, negative interest rates, very, very difficult to generate inflation. And even in the UK, after a currency devaluation in 2016, uh, very difficult to generate, generate inflation. So there's something going on about inflation that we don't quite understand. And there's many theories out there. When I say we don't quite understand, there's demographics, uh, excess savings, secular stagnation, all these theories out there which are quite hard to understand about inflation. But let's say I'm wrong, okay? Let's say inflation ticks up a bit. I think this is even more interesting. Let's say inflation ticks up to about four or 5%. And in fact, that happened in 2011. UK inflation reached 5%. Do you know what the Bank of England, actually the Monetary Policy Committee did then? Absolutely nothing. Do you know what they're gonna do this time? If inflation picks up to four or 5%, absolutely nothing. All they care about is the real economy. Uh, and so therefore, you can look at it from two ways. One, there's very, very strong evidence of low inflation globally. It's very hard to generate inflation. You need a, a currency devaluation like the, the likes you see in Turkey to generate inflation. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, globally, inflation is low. And even if we do some, see some inflation, interest rates are going to say ultra low as they protect the economy. It's called financial repression. Interestingly, we saw this in the 50s and 60s after World War II, because our debt, so there's a bit, a lot of talk about debt to GDP. 
And uh, I don't know, Duncan, do you know what it got to after World War II? I don't know the exact number. Go on, Alan, tell me. 250%. Three now we're worried about it being Do you know how they got rid of that 250%? A bit of austerity, but mainly financial repression. Mainly keeping interest rates low, and so the financing costs were low, and just growing the econom economy moderately. And I think we're going to see the same. And that's how we're going to get rid of this debt, is that, uh, unfortunately, unlike when I started my career, uh, and there was easy savings to have by just buying bonds or just leaving your money on deposit. Th that's gone. I can't see interest rates going above 1% or 2% for 10 years. What about if inflation creeps above the sort of magic 5% level? Okay, it's a fair point. Okay, but I, I think above that, a little bit above that, not an issue. But I, I think what you're hinting at is what happens if we have something let's let forget the 1970s for the moment but let's say we have a lawson boom for those of you um uh, listening in who can remember that not uh, nigella lawson uh, her father nigel lawson so in 1989 inflation did get to 10 percent in the uk um there was a mini lawson boom uh, and uh, uh do you know what interest rates got to you didn't realize i was gonna ask you, you the questions did you don't I'm, I'm happy i know the interest rates got up to 17 not quite, yeah. Mortgage rates got to, mortgage yeah, rates got 15, 15, yeah, 15. But 15, so imagine that a huge nominal rate and a huge real rate, a five percent real rate. So they really, really did defend inflation in those days. But I can't see them doing that. But I think you have a fair point if inflation went to 10, set the order of 10, a, a kind of Nigel Lawson boom, central banks probably would do something. Would they do five? I doubt it. But could you see three, four? By the way, that would be enough to induce a recession. So let's be straight and forward here. There's no free lunch with investing. Uh, investing is definitely on your side. If you like the 95, I would argue even the 98% probability investing in equities in the long run, that one or 2% where you could lose money is the scenario where inflation went to 10 or more and the central banks have to do something because it's out of control then yes, uh, we'll have a deep recession. We'll come back again because, you know, deep recession, uh, it's, it's very, very painful. It does cleanse. Markets will come back. But then most likely we'll have another 50% correction. Uh, the one we've seen this year is a, is, is, a, is a minus 35, which is a big one. But uh, well, I think we'd have another minus 50. But honestly, Duncan, I think there's a very low probability. Uh, you, you're really, you can't invest for such an outlier. Right. So therefore, you know, money in money in the bank account is going to be a poor investment going forward. It's going to be a disaster, yeah, unfortunately, uh, and because uh, because many of our mutual clients uh, remember the days. Forget going back to eighty seven and eighty nine, uh, just pre the financial crisis. The normal interest rate was five to six percent, inflation two to three. So you you, you were getting a handsome nominal yield and a decent real yield. But step back a bit uh, and think about what's the anomaly in these times. Imagine earning five or 6% nominal and 3% real for effectively doing nothing. Now you might say, oh, you're taking bank risks with a deposit. Okay, but you know, you could put that money on deposit with HSBC or JP Morgan or Coots. Or you could put it into a T-bill. What is the anomaly? Earning 3% real and 6% nominal for doing nothing, or now where you get penalized for doing nothing. I think it's closer to now. Mm -hmm. I think the, pre, the, the, the period that we had up until the financial crisis, cash investors were unusually handsomely rewarded. And, and we'll look back at that as, as, as a golden period for cash investments. And actually wrong, because you, know, you and I study finance, you shouldn't earn 3% real, 6% nominal for doing nothing. Absolutely. So, so, so therefore, it's another piece of evidence that why, if you like, the hidden hand is keeping interest rates very, very low here. So do you think we'll see a situation in the UK where we will start being charged for holding money at the banks, as we've seen in other countries like Switzerland? I really hope not. So uh, I really hope they don't go for negative rates like Switzerland and the Eurozone because it's, it's not particularly helpful because it, it tends to make banks a bit more risk averse.
because they struggle to make returns. Uh, and I think the evidence that negative rate, rates help is, is weak. So, so that would be extreme. But I think, Duncan, it's fair to say you can't rule it out. But also, in any case, um, a lot of current account products have fees attached. Um, as I'm sure many people listening in, if, especially if you're in, in some, call, some kind of premium banking product, it's quite a hefty fee. So it's not unusual for fees to be attached. But... Um, Look, it's, 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 it's certainly possible in the UK. Uh, the way I look at it, the MPC and the Bank of England would really rather avoid it. I think that's what everyone's saying. They, they, they plan for it just in case, but they'd really rather avoid it because the evidence of it being supportive is weak. So you might, you might see a sort of Danish scenario where the mortgage margin is allowed to increase and that, is off, that allows to offset the negative interest rate potentially in, on the bank accounts. There's that, but, but, but also I, I think that there's evidence that in, in Europe that banks have become more risk averse because they're struggling to make money. Imagine any business, people, the entrepreneurs listening in, if you're struggling to make money in a part of your business, it's normal to be risk averse. So if we make banks struggle to make money, they become more risk averse and we don't want them to. We want them to lend, right? Mm -hmm. Lending is what helps and drives the multiplier and dr drives growth. So I really hope that um, that this is avoided. But Duncan, you can't rule it out. Okay, so just coming to so we've had a question in about you know, with your experience in investing and you've witnessed many market corrections. Is this one any different from the past? So good question. So, so let's let's deal with the the health crisis. Obviously, is completely virtually unique certainly in, in, in modern history, uh, and the, the, st the, the, the degree of fallen GDP is as big as anything we've seen since the 1930s. So, 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 so that bit is different. However, what we forget is, is that uh, when you invest in the stock market, and, and we're talking about stock market, there's other investments as well, but when you invest in the stock market, it's longer term cash flows that matter. And the stock market is very quick to react to longer term cash flows. And there's other factors going on. So as I said, I started before 87. So basically step back a bit. I mean, um, many people will know this, but virtually every year you see a 10% correction in global equities, virtually every year. And uh, uh, in my career, I've seen four big ones. 87, about a minus 35, all over in about eight days. And, um, and, and a good reason for that. Uh, uh, actually, interestingly, out of those corrections, that's the one that's most argued about in um, it, amongst the professors of finance about why. For me, it was because the, the return from bonds and cash was just too attractive. But anyway, put that to one side. Then we have the two 50% corrections, the tech bubble um, of 2000 and the financial crisis of 0809. And now we've got another circa minus 35, this one. Uh, and um, so in that way, it's not that different. And so people listening in may be puzzled because the economy, yes, has been killed. But a couple of things to note, especially in the United States, but also to a certain extent over here, the stock market is not so-called Main Street. They call it Main Street in, in the States. So um, there's a lot of businesses, especially smaller businesses that are sadly struggling. But that's not necessarily the stock market. And especially in the United States, it's fair to say some some some. Um, some companies are actually thriving and, and to a certain extent over, over here in Europe. So there's that factor. So confusing, if you like, the Main Street economy and the stock market. But most importantly, longer term cash flows. So if you have longer term cash flows, either directly from dividends or so-called implied by owning a share of profits, you're now using an ultra low interest rate to discount those cash flows. Or a simpler way of thinking about it is that a very low interest rate is competing with, with these cash flows. But in any case, it makes, I'm sure intuitively people will understand listening to this, uh, an investment with attractive cash flows is very, very attractive. The issue is what is the risk to those cash flows? So in the short term, the risk to cash flows from airlines, hotels, retailers is very large. But guess what? They will come back. In contrast, the risk to cash flows from pharmaceutical companies, um, consumer, household is very, very low, actually. 
or on the on, on the not very low, but on the low side. And so when you aggregate that in, it together with the very low interest rate, it makes sense to me to see stocks come back quickly. And and it's actually interesting. I, I see analogies with eighty seven here. Eighty seven, there wasn't a recession, but the nature and the speed of the of, of the of the fall in the market was very much like 1987. And the disorder that we saw uh, at one stage in March was very much like 1987. Alan, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. So I'd like to welcome our second guest speaker today. Um, this is a position we do have in the Yorkshire portfolio. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Graham Cooley, who is the Chief Executive of Sheffield-based ITM Power. Now, they are the hydrogen tech company. Now, Graham joined ITM Power in June 2009. Yep. Now, Graham, can you guess what the share price was when you joined? Uh, not exactly. I think our valuation at the time was about 12 million. So... Uh um, around 12 million and of course it, today it's about 1.3 billion that's right well it was actually 14 pence when you joined and it's uh -huh. now two pound 80. very good and as you say it's about an enterprise value of about 1.4 billion mm -hmm. so graham joins us here today and the title is leading the world towards net zero emissions from the sheffield hq so we're going to put it in three sections and the first section is going to be about and Graham's going to explain why hydrogen. So why hydrogen, first of all? So maybe just a little bit on me very quickly. So um, I come from the power industry. I was um, business development manager at National Power and then at International Power. And my main background was in developing new technologies and particularly energy storage. And, and we built the world's largest electrochemical energy store um, at Little Barford, which was 100 megawatt hours. That was 20 years ago, and the record for that has only just been beaten by Elon's battery. So um, uh, a background in scaling up electrochemistry is, is, is where I've been for most of my career. Um, why hydrogen and why now? Hydrogen, first of all, is the only net zero energy gas. So it, um, what do I mean by net zero energy gas? So the largest energy vector on the planet is methane. And methane, when you use it, produces CO2. And we have to eliminate CO2. Actually, if you make hydrogen with renewable power, then you make a net zero energy gas that you can use to replace methane, a diesel, petrol, and particularly um, methane that's used in the uh, chemicals and petrochemicals industry. What, why? Um, make a net zero gas called hydrogen now. Um, two reasons. One is the cost has come down dramatically. As the cost of renewable power comes down, so the cost of renewable hydrogen comes down. What you're doing then is you're using electrons, which are incredibly difficult to store, and you're turning them into molecules which are easy to store. Okay, so what you do then is change from electrons to molecules and more molecules are used in the world for energy than electrons. And so you have the possibility of decarbonizing all those industries that you can't decarbonize with renewable power alone. Now, renewable power has really significantly come down in cost. Um, we saw the record for solar um, which actually uh, was a project in Portugal, 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour, an incredibly low cost. We're now down to four pence per kilowatt hour for offshore wind in the UK, which is lower cost than any other form of generation. Uh, so the cost structure is very important. The other important thing is the more and more renewable power that you use, the more and more energy storage that you need. And of course, as I just said, the best way of storing renewable power is to store it as molecules. So we make a device called an electrolyzer. It takes in water and it takes in renewable power and we split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And all the energy is stored in the hydrogen 
and that then is a net zero energy gas. And of course the other key driver is that the whole world is moving to net zero targets. So imagine yourself as a gas company with pipes that carry methane. So with net zero, you can't carry methane anymore. So you need a new net zero energy gas. And that's why all of the gas companies around the world are moving to hydrogen in the gas pipes. Those gas pipes then supply heat and they supply industry with the, with the methane that they need to make ammonia, methanol, steel, um, and other fuels. Uh, okay, so it's the net zero legislation and the reduction in costs that mean that hydrogen is now very high on the agenda of every government. And just to in the graph you'll see, but um, in Europe we use 400 terawatt hours of hydrogen today. So we're not talking about a new market, methanol, uh, ammonia, um, and um, refineries use 400 terawatt hours of carbonizing hydrogen today. Now, to convert that to green hydrogen, that is a market of 140 gigawatts of electrolysis. And we, we are talking there 70 billion euros of capital equipment just to decarbonize the existing applications in Europe alone. Okay, so a really huge market. Um, to incentivize the uptake of green hydrogen, the EU recently announced um, their green stimulus package, and they announced 150 billion euros for incentivizing green hydrogen. Okay, the, the target over the next four years is six gigawatts, which is 6,000 megawatts. Um, to, in the next decade, 40 gigawatts, 40,000 megawatts. Now put that in the context that the first electrolyzer company to open a gigafactory to manufacture electrolyzers is ITM Power in Sheffield. So this makes South Yorkshire the most important place for the manufacture of a key device to get the world to net zero. And 100 billion euros, that's 10 billion a year for 10 years, is for contracts for difference auctions to incentivize green hydrogen. So an a incredibly significant market that's moving very, very quickly. And, and the reason that we believe we can access this market is not just that we have the manufacturing capacity and the technology and the best performing lowest cost uh, equipment, but we also have the partnerships. We have the partners of Shell, uh, one of the world's largest energy companies, uh, Linda. We formed a 50-50 joint venture with Linda. They're our EPC contractor. They're the world's largest speciality gases company. And now SNAM, and SNAM are uh, uh, the world's second largest gas transmission company. The only larger one is Gazprom. So we've got fantastic partnerships. In terms of money, we just raised 170 million and we were two and a half times oversubscribed. And I can tell you that the capital markets are incredibly keen on investing in green hydrogen pure play companies. And ITM Power is one of the very few. So what do we have? We have great technology. Uh, manufacturing capacity, partnerships, and access to capital. Yes, yeah, so, you know, Graham's obviously highlighted the, that this is a huge market. In fact, I've seen a report out in the last couple of days that suggests that hydrogen should produce between 10 and 25 percent of all energy by 2050. Correct. And is that you know that you you see that as as a as very feasible. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's potentially more. So look, um, the largest energy vector is on the planet is methane, okay? CH4, you use it and you get CO2. Net zero means you have to totally eliminate the use of methane. So question is, 
what could you possibly replace it with? So can you give me another example of a net zero energy gas? And I'll answer my own question. There is only one. And that is green hydrogen. And nature is, what nature has given us is a molecule that's the only fuel with no carbon. Every other fuel has got carbon in it. But hydrogen, green hydrogen is the only one with no carbon in its entire supply chain. You make it with renewable power, with hydro, with solar or with wind. You split water. The splitting of the water stores the energy. The energy stored in the hydrogen molecule. And then when you use the hydrogen molecule, you get back water. Graham, is that, you know, it's clearly an enormous market. Now, yeah. ITM, I'm going to bring up a slide now that shows you know, ITM. I'd like to spend a little bit more about why ITM power really is in the sweet spot. So if you look at um, why I believe that ITM is a compelling investment. In, in the last funding round, um, uh, and every funding round we've had, I've invested my own money in ITM power. So I'm talking about it from a personal point of view as well as from an investment point of view. And of course, all of our board are investors in ITM Power as well. The market drivers are rapid adoption of large scale hydrogen energy systems and commercial activity from some of the largest energy companies in the world. So you have Shell and BP and Total and Orsted and RWE and Iberdrola and NL and Enegas and SNAM and now Gazprom, all investing in hydrogen. Uh, and it is a real massive commercial activity. This government stimuli now is pointing in every green package towards um, stimulating the hydrogen industry because it's the only thing that gives you net zero. So uh, um, th those are the market drivers. What, what are um, ITM's objectives? We're into scaling. Uh, first of all, manufacturing. We saw this coming two years ago and we established um, the world's largest electrolyzer factory, which has a capacity of one gigawatt per annum or a thousand megawatts per annum. And we built it in Sheffield. Okay, it's Bessemer Park, which is just off junction 34. And if you're a Yorkshire investor, you can drive past the factory. It's the world's largest with the world's best electrolyzer technology. And we're developing the, the best after sales support. We monitor every single one of our electrolyzers in the field with a control system uh, and 24 hour monitoring all done in, uh, at the head office in Sheffield. Um, and our business developers now work very closely with Linda and Linda are a global company. So our business development reach is massive. And we raised the money so that we could um, both accelerate and hold on to our technology and manufacturing lead, but also so that we could increase our global reach. And for us, it's not only about servicing at the UK market, where, where the market is in the gigawatts, but also being an exporter from South Yorkshire to the rest of the world. Well, we've had a number of questions come in and you know, you've, you've explained the size of the markets. Yeah. You've talked about ITM power and where you have this unique position. One of the questions that came in was how can ITM power compete with the global superpowers, both countries and companies? Mm -hmm. What do you have? What is unique about ITM power? Yeah, well, we work with global superpowers, of course. So um, we work with Shell and um, uh, they're one of the largest energy companies, as you know. They have um, uh, very strong targets now for decarbonizing. They have no choice. Um, we work with uh, Linda. Linda's the largest deployer of grey hydrogen. That's hydrogen used in industry in the world. And they're the largest EPC contractor, that's engineering, procurement and construction. There's no one larger in hydrogen right now. Um, and we also work with SNAM, as I said to you, they're the second largest um, 
gas trans transmission company. Okay. But there are many, many more companies that work with us that we haven't announced that we're already working with. We work with Philips 66, we work with Orsted and so on. Um, now, what you're going to say to me is there'll be new entrants from all over the world, and I absolutely agree. Um, and um, they're going to have to go through the journey that we've been through. We've been uh, doing this for 20 years. We've been slowly developing our technology in Sheffield for 20 years. I started 11 years ago. We defined our first products 11 years ago. Um, we launched the first ones um, in 2011. That's nine years ago. And um, fast forward to 2020 and we're building the world's largest PEM electrolyzer at the Rhineland refinery with Shell. There will be new entrants. We don't fear any of them. They have a big journey to go through like we had to. Another question, thank you very much. Another question we had come in was, you know, can ITM power remain independent? Surely it's a race that needs very deep pockets given the size of this market. Yeah, I mean, we, we um, as I said to you, we just raised 170 million and we were two and a half times over, oversubscribed. And I now have massive funds who, um, he said, I mean, on occasions, funds said, do you know what? You're a bit small for us yet. Um, and so we went into a new bracket, which is the billion pound market cap. And suddenly we had a whole series of new funds that could now look at us. And they invested. Um, and the city's now incredibly well informed about green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. and everybody's writing thematic notes. And I'm on phone calls now. We've just been recently covered by Citibank, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, I mean, uh, as, as Stifle, um, Bernstein, everybody's piling in because they've realized that the key device to give you a net zero energy gas is the electrolyzer. And, and the biggest manufacturer is in Sheffield. Excellent. Well, it's very good to hear that, you know, Yorkshire has another very dominant position in, in a particular niche field, which is now becoming a very, very large field. Yeah, now, and, you know, um, Sheffield's a great place to do business. It, it really is. I mean, the amount of engineering skills in Sheffield, the amount of subcontractors. I mean, we, we um, an electrolyzer is a, it is a power system, a gas system, a water system, and a control system. And there are engineering experts in all of those areas in Sheffield. It's a great place. Good. Graham, just before we finish, I've got one question I'd like to ask you. I know you're an avid collector of vinyl. Now, you clearly recognise growth because obviously the uh, vinyl industry has also been growing by, you know, for the last 12 years. So on a desert island, which three would you, which three would you take? Which three albums would I take? Indeed. Crikey, you know, I didn't know you were going to ask me that. Um, all right, so I like, um, I like psychedelia from the late 1960s, and associated with that, I like British blues. So the British blues movement. So something maybe from Peter Green, Eric Clapton, uh, perhaps a Cream album, or maybe Blind Faith from that period. Uh, also very keen on dub reggae. So I, I grew up with punk and dub reggae. So I might go with um, Steel Pulse, Handsworth Revolution, which was a fantastic album about a part of Birmingham. And then last of all, I was a big fan of the Smiths. So I, 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 I saw the Smiths loads of times, particularly when they were supported by James. I don't you know the band James as well, probably. Indeed. So I'll probably take um, The Queen Is Dead. By, by the Smiths. So oh, that's great for you. Dr. Graham Cooley, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome our final guest today, who is Mark Brewer from HGH Regional Accountants. Now, Mark was uh, born and bred in Yorkshire and uh, has been working for HGH for 32 years, Mark? Yeah, that's correct. Excellent. Now, Mark, today the title was Turnover is Vanity, Profit is Sanity, and Cash is Reality. 
So uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Um, yeah, interesting little saying that turnover is vanity, profit is uh, sanity, and uh, cash is reality. The mistake that businesses make is that they chase the turnover uh, without particularly taking into account what profit they might be making on it. Now, sometimes that can be a, a little goal for the business to try and get some market share by chasing the turnover, but it's not a long-term success strategy. So you really need as a business to focus on the profit side of things. And as I said, profit then is the sanity of it all that you are doing. However, underlying all this is the issue of cash, because if you don't have the cash, then the profit won't matter and the turnover won't matter. So that's why that saying is, is uh, appropriate, especially in our times as we have at the moment. I think uh, what obviously I wanted to sort of touch on today, Duncan, was just to stress how important it is to look after the future of, um, of any business. So it can be quite easy to be caught up in the short uh, term issues that businesses face at the moment with the coronavirus, how that impacting on their business, the fact that they may have taken out loans to, to survive. But really, you've still got to keep that eye on the longer term goal as to what the business is trying to achieve. And this is just a little process that will take you through that longer term life cycle. So that's where I'm trying to, trying to get a bit of a message over uh, to our listeners today. Good. So, you know, leading on from that, so what would be your sort of top tips for businesses and individuals during the pandemic? Yeah, um, certainly for businesses, you need to be flexible. You need to be able to adapt to the current uh, climate that we're in. There's plenty of businesses out there that have been forced to shut, but can they do anything else? Can they think uh, of other ways of generating income? You know, simple things could be just setting up uh, an e-commerce site, uh, see if you can expand your sales, not just for regional sales, but certainly for national sales. Um, that's a common thing that can very easily be done with a bit of time. And if business owners aren't spending the money on other things, they could look at, and their time on other things, they could certainly look at uh, something simple as an e-commerce site to, uh, to extrapolate their sales. Certainly need that, that flexibility. Um, you also need, I think, really to look, at, look after your, your staff. They are a very important asset in any business. And I've heard a couple of what I think are horror stories where a business has a 10% uh, salary cut across the board to their, to their employees and then put them on furlough. So it actually works out that when they were on furlough, they were only getting 72% of what they were getting prior to lockdown, uh, the first lockdown. And these pay cuts have continued all the way through. And of course, the morale that that then generates within the workforce has just dipped dramatically. And at some point, which I'm sure will happen, if these employers then go back to the employees and ask them to, to help and put a bit of extra work in, again, because of the loss of morale within the business, they're less likely to do it. There's less loyalty to that business. So I think looking after your staff is also a, a key element that I would say is another top tip. And the third one really is to then, as I said, looking onto the cash side of things, are struggling for cash. What avenues have you, have you looked into? Most businesses have looked into this by, by now, by the um, coronavirus business interruption loans, although they are very difficult to get, can be, can be quite tricky, especially with your main bank. There are other lenders that do uh, process these claims, these uh, loans far quicker. There's also, of course, the business, uh, sorry, the bounce loan, which is very easy to get. So uh, you can borrow up to 50,000 on that basis, 25. So I didn't quite catch that one. Yeah, 50,000 pounds, Duncan, you can borrow for a, a bounce back loan. Right, thank you. Uh, which, as long as that's uh, less than 25% of your turnover. Uh, there are also grants uh, that have come out. Obviously, there were initial raft of grants uh, based on your business rates. There's now also another raft of uh, grants coming out, again, based on your business rates which works for most businesses, but there are a number of businesses that maybe don't operate from the premises, that work from home, 
that don't get these sort of grants. And that's where there's a gap in potentially what um, the government are trying to do, because not every business has are paid salaries. Quite often they're paid dividends. Uh, and not getting uh, support from the government, not getting the grants. There is a, a small percentage of businesses that are, are falling through the, the gaps in, the, in these grants. The other thing, of course, businesses can do is also consider time to pay arrangements with the revenue. So, and if they are struggling to pay the corporation tax, the VAT, uh, income tax, the pay as you earn, uh, the easiest thing to do is to ring the revenue and have a discussion with them and arrange the time to pay. They are being very receptive at the moment. As long as you do call them, it's not nice bringing the revenue after or well after the due date. It's better to do it in advance. And as far as uh, individuals go, again, it's again, it's probably just managing their affairs, looking at what they've got, what have we got invested, where is it invested, do we need to reconsider it, um, do we need to look at our pensions, what is our longer term strategy? leading up to potentially up to retirement. Uh, so it might be worth having a review uh, with your financial advisor to, to look at the, the individual side of things, your personal investments, so those that are outside of the business, because ultimately your business and your individual side have to run hand in hand. And given our, so our emphasis on local community investing, you mentioned there that a lot of smaller companies have fallen through the net. Have the local authorities picked up the slack there at all? Are you aware of any sort of grants that have become available recently? I know in the first lockdown there were a number of sort of grants that appeared very quickly. Has anything come up this time in the second lockdown where smaller companies can look to you know, help their cash flow situation? Unfortunately, not that I've seen, Duncan, no. Uh, in the first one, there were some smaller grants that did come out, but they were only small grants and it does make a difference to to smaller businesses, uh, those who did uh, slip through the, the, the cracks. Um, uh, but I've not yet seen anything else coming out to help those businesses on the second lockdown that we're, we're currently in. I'm sure the local councils will be there to help at some point. <laughs> I'm sure they will, Duncan. I'm sure they will. So are there any sort of quick wins that companies can take to sort of improve their cash flow? Because clearly, like you say, you know, after the first lockdown, a lot of people have been through their cash flow very carefully, but are, there any, are, there, are you coming across any opportunities that you know, companies are perhaps not looking at, which really they, they should be looking at? Yeah, there, there's a whole raft of things that businesses can do, certainly short term. And the first one is just looking at the way that they raise their invoices and when they raise their invoices. So can they consider raising an invoice in advance and payment up front? Can they consider putting in discounts so that their customers pay them quicker? Okay, they, they lose a little bit on the, on the actual value of the sales, but ultimately they, they win by getting the cash in the bank quicker. And as I said before, see cash is reality. That's what we want. So that's one thing they can certainly do very quickly. Similarly, on the purchasing side, on their uh, if they if they if they have stock, can they do it on a just in just out system? So buy almost to order to keep the cash in the business for as long as possible, mm -hmm. and then get, turn it around as quickly as possible to get the cash back in. And similarly, is it worth? calling your suppliers, see if you can have an extension to your payment terms. Um, potentially even the other way, are there discounts that a supplier are willing to offer to your business? So again, you might want to pay early, but if you get a 5-10% discount, that can also save you the cash as well. So there's a few things you can do with your customers and there's a few things you can do with your suppliers. If another thing that could become um, useful is if you are thinking or contemplating buying some piece of equipment or a new van, new vehicle for your business, rather than buying it and having a large uh, upfront payment required, would you lease it um, and look at alternative ways of buying that uh, equipment or lease. And what thing, one thing you could also do, which I always say is a bit of a, a bit of a one, well, an easy one that businesses get to, is 
revisit your pricing uh, prices. You quite often I go in to see businesses and their sales figures or their pricings haven't changed in two, three, four, even five years. Uh, businesses, well, any size of business, just don't seem to be, seem very nervous to alter their prices. Now, granted, we're in potentially in a pandemic, but in, in some cases there is a scarcity of products out there. So if you're selling a product, it's very difficult to get. Are you still selling it at the same price as what you were before? Now, I'm not suggesting profiteering. I am suggesting look at your prices and, and get maximum value from what you from what you do, from what you sell, whether that's an actual product or a service that you offer. Very, very easily uh, it's by all all businesses, but very easy to change. Okay, good. So we've had a question in, you know, what is the most common failure of companies that you've come across mm -hmm. where, you know, you've been in the business a long time. So the, the most common failure you've come across in sort of difficult economic periods. Yeah, uh, I have been in business a long time. Thank you for the reminder, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, it's a very easy one to answer. The, the, the most common reason why businesses fail is cash. They run out of cash. They cannot turn the stock over quick enough, the cash over quick enough. Um, and often, if there's, especially if there's a bank uh, involved and there's a bank loan on some property uh, or equipment or an overdraft in place and they're up to the limit, it is cash. It's not not making losses or you know in most cases they'll still be a profitable business but they just don't have enough cash and they can't turn it around quick enough okay good mark so i think from what you said if i could to summarize you'd say remain flexible and adaptable in your business model talk to your customers and suppliers and as important talk to the authorities before you have a debt you know rather than afterwards. Yeah. Excellent. So any, any, one, any one nugget you'd like to, uh, to leave before we finish? One nugget. Um, yeah, I think businesses really do need to look forward. And I'm not just saying 12 months, I'm saying, you know, potentially up to five years, even 10 years. And again, we see a lot of businesses that don't have a, a structured business plan and don't have a cash flow forecast in place. So my nugget would be to make, certainly make sure you've got a cash flow forecast in place at least for 12 months, possibly even longer, three years, five years, especially with the Siebel's loans. You've got to factor in when they're going to be repaid. Can you afford to repay them? And also do your cash flows on at least two um, potential outcomes, one of which is the worst case, one of which could be obviously your best case and somewhere in between potentially for the third one. So that would be my nugget. Make sure you do plenty of planning uh, ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for your time today. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank our three speakers today. We've learned about the demise of cash in our bank accounts from Alan Higgins, the importance of green hydrogen from Sheffield, from Dr. Graham Cooley. And finally, some advice on cash preservation during this pandemic from Mark Rua. Now, our next webcast is due in early 2021, where we will introduce another Yorkshire company from the MVAM T20 portfolio. Now, if you would like more information, then please get in touch with us or our partners, HCH Accountants, at the address below. Finally, I'd like to wish you all a happy Christmas and we look forward to seeing you in person in 2021. Thank you. <laughs>